All right. So I'm Mike McKelvey. I'm the lead pastor here at Family Church, in case you have not had an opportunity to meet me. I want to give you a little bit of background about myself today. I have three children. Pray for me. My oldest is 16. She just got her license. I don't know if that was clap worthy. My second oldest is 14, both girls. And then my youngest is my son. He's six years old. A little bit of an age gap there. So uh, if you know anything about having older sisters or whatever else, Liam does not have one father and one mother and two sisters. He has one father and three mothers. Can I get an amen, somebody? If you're a guy and you had an older sister, she tried to be your mama, right? And that's that's how Liam is. And uh, the other day, we had some guests over our house and the families had children and they come over to play and Liam has tons of toys, right? Your kids got tons of toys, so many toys, they don't even need that many toys. Like you need one matchbox car. You don't need all of them, but he's got a bunch of toys and they're neatly organized into these bins in the family room. They're, They're organized by size toy and type of toy. And these kids come over to Liam's space and only child syndrome kicks in, right? Because there's such a large age gap between the older kids and Liam, they don't ever play with Liam's toys. They don't care about his toys. So he has a tendency to have only child syndrome. Now, whether you have kids or not, you've experienced a child with only child syndrome right? All the singles in the house are like, well, this doesn't really apply to me. I don't have kids. But you've seen somebody who has only child syndrome, or maybe you yourself have only child syndrome. And that is, these are mine. Everything's about me, right? And so I say, Liam, these kids are here to play with you, which means that they're here to play with your toys. And You have to share, Liam. Share your toys. And immediately I can see panic (laughs) come over his face as the kids start pulling out bins and picking up his toys. And he's like, Daddy, they're going to mess up all my toys. Daddy, they're going to break my toys. Daddy, they're going to lose pieces to my Legos. Daddy, they don't know how to play with my toys like I do. I said, Papi, you have to share your toys. Have you ever had to teach your kids? You have to share your toys. We bought these toys for you to share so that when people come over, you get it, right? But that didn't work. He became anxious and moody. He went up to those kids and snatched I mean, son, you're six. That kid was three. (laughs) Snatched that toy right out of his hand. And then he went on like, he went on a mission. He goes, he's hiding his toys, right? He's opening cupboards he's never been in. He's hiding a toy here. He's taking a toy. He's like hiding his other valuable toys here. The kids were all small. So he takes his other toys and he puts them on top of the fireplace mantle. Right? He puts them up on a high shelf where the other kids can't reach them. And I tell you this story today to ask you along the same questions of sharing. Maybe you've done the same thing when it comes to sharing your faith. When it comes to sharing your faith. Maybe you've experienced some of these same anxieties that my son had when your church talks about evangelism. When it talks about sharing your faith, these same kind of things like, I don't think I can tell somebody what I believe. I don't want it to be attacked. I don't want it to be broken. Maybe others, well, you know, I would share my faith, but it was so hard for me to come to Christ, and I had to sacrifice so many things (laughs) that I'm going to put my salvation up on a shelf where no one else can reach it. They're obviously not ready to hear the gospel that I know. Huh? Huh? I wonder if we've done the same things about sharing. Today's topic is this, love shares. 
Love shares. And today, I'm going to start with a passage of scripture that is the most popular Bible verse. Uh, You will find this Bible verse on uh, posters at football games, basketball games, and it's John 3.16. Right? John 3.16, and I'm sure many of you know this from by heart, but if you've never heard this scripture before and you've only seen the reference, we'll put it up on the screen behind me and say it with me. For God so loved the world that he shared. He shared. For God so loved the world, he shared his most prized possession, his most prized toy, The thing that meant the most to him in all of creation, in all of eternity, God said, I take my most valuable possession and I share it with humanity. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. Now, most most of us stop reading John 3, 16 right there. But in my opinion, John 3.17 is as powerful, if not more powerful, than John 3.16. Read it with me. And it says this, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Amen? I'm here today to tell you that if you're feeling condemned, if people... Uh, of church or believers in Christ say things to you that make you feel condemned, you're not hearing God. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it. Right? So he's not condemning sinners because that would be the world, people far from God. And there's another verse that says, there is therefore now No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation is not of God. Hey, somebody. Condemnation comes, the Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. There is such a thing as violating your own moral compass. That you made decisions that go against the way that you were raised. That, that there could be a guilt that comes because you violated your own conscience. But let's, let me throw this out there to you. The Bible tells us here, this is not God condemning us. God came to share his love. The Bible says this, that there is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love drives away fear. So these other children, they come over to the house fully expecting to be welcomed by my son and to participate in playing with all of Liam's toys. Yet, my son had other plans. We will play on my terms. I wonder how many people looking for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ have walked into churches that said, you can't play with all God's toys. You first have to meet his terms. I wonder how many people looking for Jesus first have to get a dictionary of Christianese to even understand what we're talking about. Come on, I'm just throwing this out there to you today. All of the children expected that we will play together. We'll all enjoy what Liam has. I wonder if we've created churches today that anybody could come in and say, I'm going to enjoy all the blessings that God has for me. Or do people feel that they have to meet some certain criteria first before God would accept them into the family and let them play with the blessings? Only child syndrome. Could you imagine if God the Father had only father syndrome? Huh? I'm not going to share. I'm not going to play nice with others. You all just need to bow down and worship me. You all just need to be better. God knew that we couldn't be better without him. He knew that he couldn't just send another, but he himself had to come into the earth to redeem us and save us. He had to share the greatest part of himself. So maybe this has happened to you 
But this happened to me a while back. I was walking through the mall, minding my own business, getting my shop on. Someone comes up to me, a young man comes up to me in the middle of the mall and begins to proselytize, begins to share his faith with me in an effort to convert me to his faith. And so um, I'm pretty quick with that. And I was just like, hey, man, you know, no offense, but I'm a pastor of a church in Middletown. I'm all good, man. I know Jesus. I love him. He's like, oh. Well, here's my material just in case you need it. He looked at me in a way as if he thought maybe I was lying to him. Like, maybe I'm not actually a Christian, so just in case you were lying, here's my information. I think he didn't like my tattoos. Because maybe, maybe in his part of the world, tattoos send you to hell. So he had to just make sure. Go down a little bit further. Still doing my shopping. Another man approaches me from a different type of religious tradition, trying to tell me about Mother God. Same kind of thing happens. I say, hey man, you know, I'm a pastor in Middletown. Um, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I'm so good. Oh, but you haven't heard the full gospel. As if his belief system was superior to my belief system. Right? Well, there's just still some stuff you don't know. So here's my material in case you're ready to actually learn the truth. And as I left the mall, I was angry. I was angry, man, you know? And, and I, wasn't so, I wasn't so much angry at what they were doing because it would be my hope that all of us would want to share our faith. But not for nothing, man. Like, I'm in the mall trying to buy the perfect pair of sneakers. My mind and my heart are trying to fill myself with joy with just another pair of sneakers. Do I go purple or do I go red? All of a sudden, you bombard me with Mother God. Get what I'm saying? And I'm leaving angry. And I had to wonder why am I angry about somebody who's trying to do something good and share their faith. As a minister, I'm sympathetic to that. But as a human being, I was angry. No sooner do I arrive home that there's a knock at my door. from another religious group. Black suit, white shirt, black tie. I'm like, here we go! <laughs> Same sort of thing, man. I'm just trying to say, hey, listen, I already have a belief system. I believe Jesus Christ in my life. Yeah, but you believe in heaven on earth? And I said, yeah, I'm living heaven on earth right now, but there's one day there's gonna be a rapture and the dead in Christ shall rise and then we're like, hey, somebody, let me go! No, but it, it became a little obnoxious. It was a little annoying. There was like this confrontation to the point where I had to just like biblically and spiritually and in loving way, shut the door. <laughs> I was disturbed. And it took me a while to sort through my emotions as to what I was feeling because at the end of the day, I believe that every believer should share their faith. What was it about this that bothered me so bad? And it was a sense that I was feeling that they were trying to manipulate me. I don't like feeling manipulated. I don't like feeling cornered. I don't like feeling trapped. I don't like feeling like you're asking me trick questions to set me up to drop a bomb on me about how bad I am. Come on. None of these evangelists had showed any interest in me as a person. Not one of them asked me my name. Not one of them asked me how I was feeling today. 
Now, one of them asked me if there was anything I was going through they could pray for me for. I was a checkbox on a list of things they had to do in order to accomplish their mission for the day. They didn't care about me. And I think that's what was bothering me the most. Not one of them had taken the time to ask my name, nor did they attempt to find out what my needs were, how they might help me, how their religion would benefit my life in the current situation that I was dealing with. They all operated under the assumption, now listen, they all operated under the assumption that all my needs could be met simply by converting to their faith. I wonder how many times we've tried to sell Christianity the same way. All you need is Jesus. And all your problems will go away. Except for the fact that I prayed the prayer and tomorrow I woke up with the same problem. Who is going to walk with me through the steps of faith every day? This is what I'm trying to say here. I'm just throwing this out there to you because love shares, but love can't share and then run away. Christianity is not about just getting somebody converted. Christianity is about the relationship that it brings. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whosoever would believe in him would have a relationship with him. <laughs> right? I should have been sharper. I should have, I should have been I immediately recognizing those techniques that they were using on me, but I will be honest, I was distracted by the love of sneakers. <laughs> I was in the zone. I had them laid out. I mean, the new Jordans had just dropped and I was contemplating the investment into some uh, high-end footwear. I should have recognized these techniques because I had been taught. I had been taught that way. I was part of a, a program that went to Syracuse University and we walked the streets of the university and we started our conversation with total strangers like this. Hey, can I have a second of your time? If you were to die today, no, like, I'm serious. If you're to walk across campus and a bus hits you, would you spend eternity in heaven or hell? Everybody, just about everybody was like, oh, I'm going to heaven. Except for the few people who said, no, I'll probably go to hell. And they were pretty excited about it. <laughs> but most of the people were like, no, I'm going to heaven. I said, well, why are you going to heaven? Because I'm a good person. I said, oh, you think you're a good person? Come on, come on, you heard this. Oh, you think you're a good person? Have you ever stolen anything? No, like even a little piece of candy when you're a kid from the, from the candy store. You ever stolen anything? Yeah, I've stolen something. Have you ever told a lie? Yeah, I've told a lie. Have you ever looked at someone as to lust after them in your heart? Yeah. Yeah, you're going to hell. <laughs> but there's good news. There's good news. God sent his only son to the world that you don't have to go to hell. But you can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And we have what's called scare evangelism. Scare evangelism. Or shut your mouth evangelism. I'll say whatever I have to say for you to shut your mouth. I'll just agree to whatever you say. I'll pray whatever prayer you guys say. Just so you leave me alone. And I'll tell you that didn't make actual converts. That made people who never want to walk through the doors of church again. Just listen to what I'm saying to you. I should have recognized it because I was taught, listen, if someone's hostile or they're disagreeable, cut the conversation, move on to the next person because we got to get as many converts as we can in a day. We, you know, we're going to pray. We handed out 10,000 tracts today. 9,000 ended up in the garbage. We could have saved a tree. I'm saying we could have saved that paper. I've been part of it. I've done it. I've seen it. I know. The goal of, the, of that experience was to convert as many people in the shortest amount of time. And it took me a long time to unlearn those techniques. It took me a long time to look at someone who needed Jesus and not first judge them. Because that's what that evangelism does. Oh, look at them. They need Jesus. 
Because look, right now, they're lying right now. Look at the little, they, they, It wasn't as if, oh my God, I love you. I need to share my hope with you. It was, you're a wreck. And you need some Jesus. And what we did was, oh, I don't want you. I don't want nothing to do with you. You just need to go to Jesus. Sing songs. What the world needs is Jesus. What the world needs is you. What the world needs is you in your healthiest form, in your most life-giving way. The world needs you. The Bible says that you are ambassadors for Christ, that, 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 that the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you is to draw people to the saving knowledge. Of Jesus. But it's you. It's us today. It's every believer. Today I want to introduce to you relational evangelism. How we share our faith, how we promote Christianity here at Family Church. It's moving out of only Christian syndrome to a Christianity and uh, living our faith out loud that impacts the people around us. Listen to this. Listen to this study. Studies show and polls show that over the last two decades, the last 20 years, there has been a steady increase in the number of Americans that say they are atheist, agnostic, religiously unaffiliated, or believe in nothing at all. Each generation, from Generation X to the Millennials to now Gen Z, is significantly less religious and less church-going than the generation before. This generation that we see now in the teen center, they're called Generation Z, right, Gen Z, and they are what's called a post-Christian generation, post-Christian, that they have no exposure to church, to Christianity, or to God, the generation at, at, at whole. And they're the largest generation since the boomers. In fact, they are the largest living population on the earth right now. Post-Christian. This should mean that Christians talk more to their neighbors and to their colleagues and to their friends about the reasons they believe in Jesus, but that's not happening. I just got to drop a bomb on you. He's got to kind of tell you why. And I'm not going to get all political or anything on you, but... But it's this, we, we've, we've allowed this thing, and, and, and hear, hear me out, we've allowed this teaching of tolerance to come into our lives. I believe everyone should be accepted just the way they are. That's the way God sees it. But the tolerance teaching is different than that. Tolerance says, don't you ever try to share what you believe to somebody else in hopes of them believing what you believe. Therefore, it has crushed evangelism. Gen Z actually believes it's wrong to share their beliefs, although they're committed to them, to share their beliefs with someone else in hopes of that person converting. They feel it's wrong. And we've allowed this. We've allowed this into a generation because we haven't taught them what absolute truth is. What this generation believes is what's true for you is true for you. What's true for me is true for me. But that's not absolute truth. Jesus said there's only one absolute truth. I mean, listen, gravity is absolute truth. You want to go test that theory, jump out the window. Are you going to hit? Well, no, I did not say jump. I, I meant do not jump out the window. Do not jump out the window. Cut that from the video. Jesus said, thy word is truth. The word of God, the Bible, is absolute truth. All right? Check this out. Today, I'm not going to go into all the reasons why we're not sharing our faith. You already know why you don't. Well, I'm, I'm switching it up here today. I'm going to show you how to. What the Bible says is the appropriate way for faith to be shared in a life-giving way. And so we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5, and it says this. Who after all is Apollos? Or who is Paul? 
Maybe you haven't been to church uh, ever. Maybe you're part of the post-Christian generation. And you're like, yeah, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? I have no idea. We're going to get to that. Who is Apollos? Who is Paul? And he says, we're only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. Paul and Apollos, they're like the godfathers of faith. I mean, these guys literally wrote the book on Christianity and what the Acts church, the Acts 2 church is. Like they were outlining what church was. They were the first real true apostles setting up churches and flipping them and and church plants and partnerships. And they're saying this, we're nobody. We're nobody but servants. And we had a job to do. Watch what Paul says. Paul says, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But it has been God, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So he's saying here, we all have a small part to play. It doesn't matter who planted the word or or, or the truth of the gospel. It doesn't matter who waters it. What matters is that God is the one making this grow. Now watch. The one who planted and the one who waters have one purpose. You got one job to do. And they will be rewarded in heaven according to their labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. You are God's church. But what's the one purpose? See, we got to answer this question. What's the one purpose? The one purpose is not to make converts. Only God can make a convert. This is why churches are filled with people who never actually converted. Oh, that wasn't an amen moment. Churches are filled with people who never actually converted because they never actually surrendered to God. They never actually developed a relationship with God. They, They agreed, they mentally agreed with a teaching. They agreed with a prayer. They prayed a prayer, but they never committed to a relationship. Listen, listen to what I'm saying here. We as believers in evangelism have one purpose, and that's to build a relationship. We can't make converts. I can't convert somebody. You can't convert somebody. You can build a relationship, though. Today, I want to give you three simple points about how love shares. The first point is this. Make a friend. Make a friend. We all need a friend. And at the surface, making a friend seems kind of easy, unless, of course, you have a hard time making friends. Let me just ask a question. Who can be your friend? Who can be your friend? I remember when I took over as pastor, I, I went out and I tried to make as many pastor friends as I could. I joined every group, every organization to just find somebody else that just wanted to be my friend. I was like, man, this is going to be awkward when I have summer conference and I can't bring anybody in to preach because I got no friends. Huh? And there's just one guy, I'll never forget it, and I'm, a, I'm still a little salty about it. I said, we were at dinner together at one of these conferences. I'm like, yo, man, I'd love to stay connected with you. Let me get your number, whatever. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, here's my Instagram. I'm like, say, what? Yeah, here's my Instagram. Oh, so I can't be your friend. See, because I was asking for your cell phone number. I was asking for your cell phone number. Not, for, not to be your follower. I wasn't asking to be your follower. I wasn't asking to be a social media partner. I was asking to be your friend. And he was very clear, no, no, you can't be my friend, but you can be my follower. Who can be your friend? Well, let's just be friends on Facebook. Now, how about you give me a cell phone number? Uh, you know, that's kind of like intimate. My cell number? Like, yeah, let me have your cell number. See, who can be your friend? Who can be your friend? Listen to what the Bible says in Proverbs 18, 24, and this is one of the most misquoted passages of Scripture. Proverbs 18, 24, a man that has friends must show himself friendly 
and there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Do you know what this means? Do you, do you understand the depths of what this scripture actually says? This says, because God calls you his friend, be a friend. He says, you are my friend, and with my friends I share the secrets of my covenant. God calls us that. He says, who are you to refuse friendship to anybody when I call you my friend? Well, you know, they don't really fit my socioeconomic level. I'm in the middle class. They're in the not so middle class. And you could lose that class very quickly with that attitude. Who can be your friend? Who do you open yourself up to that someone could access your life and be part of a life with you? Second part is this, be a friend. So, so there's the people who go all over, uh, they, they make friends with everybody. They got 10,000 friends on Facebook, but you can never get a hold of them. I remember I had a, I'm not going to mention any names because you get really salty if you heard this one. I had a, a guest in and I was just telling him, hey man, I've just been trying to make friends. And he was like, yo man, here's my cell number. Hit me up anytime. One thing I am is a friend. And I was like, oh great. And so we're at another conference together, sitting three seats apart. And I text him, yo man, hope you do great today. Never text me back. Like bro, you're three seats away from me. You, you're in the same row as me. So I was like, all right, maybe he's just busy, didn't get back to it. There's another time where, you know, he's like, uh, I, I, needed, I needed to talk to somebody, I was, uh, sent him a text. To this day, never responded. He, he was available to me. Who are you available to? Who can actually call you when they need something? Okay, you made the friendship, but are you watering it? Are you watering that friendship? You know, putting a lawn in, new grass in your yard can be the hardest task or the easiest task. It's the hardest task if you're not committed to it. If you don't really want to go out and water it and keep it uh, uh, growing, you're never going to grow front lawn. But if you stay committed to it and you go out there every day and you water for five minutes a day, it's the easiest thing. Friendship's the easiest thing if you're committed to watering it. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but only God can make it grow. This is ongoing communication that then leads to transformation. The last point is this, then bring a friend to Christ. Bring a friend to Christ. Pastor Mike, see, that's the hardest part there because I don't know what to say. I don't know the prayer. I don't know. Do you know your story? Share your story. Why are you sitting in these seats today? What is it about the Christian faith? What is it about Jesus that makes you bank all of your eternity on the fact that it's true? Tell your story. Why do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? What has happened in your life that has brought you to that moment? I don't have time today to share my God story, but my God story was very like, slap me in the face, wake up, this is what you're doing with your life. All right? And it wasn't because I was looking for it. In fact, I was doing everything to run from it. I was raised in church my whole life. My dad started the church when I was three years old. I was raised in church. I didn't want nothing to do with it. Come on. What's your God story? What's your story of belief? Your story of faith? Your story of salvation? So today, I want to give you a little, uh, a little rhythm to these three points. With this rhythm... I believe that you could forever remember this. If you're ever in a spot where you're like, you know what, I think it's time for me to share my faith, you can easily remember these three steps. Ready? Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. Make a friend, bring a friend, bring a friend to Christ. Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. All right. That's it, three easy steps. Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. You're like, you know, I don't know if I could bring someone to Christ. All right, so then change it to church. Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to church. (coughs) Bring them into your community. 
Bring them into your group. Church should not be clicks. There should be one click. It's called the body of Christ. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a hard end to my message here and just say this. If you're not sharing your faith, if your neighbors don't know your gospel story, if your colleagues don't know your gospel story, ready? You don't actually love them. You don't love them. You have only Christian syndrome. It's about me. It's about my relationship with God. So I'm going to hide it. I'm going to put it way up on a shelf. I'm going to protect it, make sure it don't get broken. But I'm certainly not sharing the love of God with those around me. Because I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to be inconvenienced. Then there's not love there. I heard an atheist make this statement. It forever changed my view of Christianity. He said, how much must a Christian hate someone that they believe that their truth, their gospel, their Christianity is the only way to eternal life and not share it with somebody else? He said, how much must they hate someone to believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, that the only way to the Father, the only way to eternal life is through Jesus Christ and then keep that to themselves? I said, he's right. He's right. That's not what it should be. But it should be based on relationship. Because God wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us. I want to close out this series on heart for the house by telling you that God has a heart for you. Because you're his house. The Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says that it is the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. The the Bible says that it is God's plan that all men shall come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and that none should perish. That's the design of God. That's his will. But we have to believe that we are God with skin on today. And that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and is drawing our friends, our family, our colleagues to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Here's my hope today. Connect with me for two more minutes. Here's my hope today is that in this house, we would live out Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8 says this, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And because you have the Holy Spirit, watch what it says, you will be my witnesses. He didn't say you'll go witnessing. He said you'll be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. What he's saying here is this, because of the difference that the Holy Spirit makes in your life, people will notice a difference. People will notice that a conversion happened and the conversion leads to conversation. Conversion to conversation. Conversation to conversion. Come on. Make a friend. Be a friend. Bring a friend to Christ. Father, we thank you for today that your word will not return to you void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. Holy Spirit, I ask you right now to rise up in the heart of every believer and empower them to be a witness. God, help us to be the light in the dark places that you would give us the words to speak, that you would open doors of opportunity with this holiday season upon us and family around table. Help us to be thankful for our salvation in Jesus. Maybe we could have opportunity to have life-giving conversations that would glorify Jesus Christ. Now, if you're in here today or you're watching online and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we wanna offer that to you today. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. And maybe you walked in here today or maybe you're watching online and you feel a difference about today's service. You feel a difference about the gospel that we are preaching and you feel it in your stomach. Something's tugging on your heart. That might be the Holy Spirit calling you to the body of Christ. And so today we want to simply pray a prayer with you, not to check something off a box and not just to make a convert, but to start a relationship with you. 
that we could start this journey, this gospel journey with you through the first few weeks, the first few months of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that prayer goes like this. If you pray with me, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Woo! That just feels good doing it, even if you've said it 10,000 times. But if you prayed that for the very first time today, I want to take two seconds and I want to celebrate you real quick. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you forward. But if you prayed that for the very first time, would you just wave your hand at me? I see you, buddy. Anybody else real quick? Just kind of wave at me real quick. Anybody else? Over here. Awesome. We celebrate you. Yeah, man. All right. Yeah, man. All right. Hallelujah. There's a booklet on the seat back in front of you. It says, Welcome Home. It talks about Christianity here. It talks about how you can get connected to Family Church to begin this journey. Starting early in January, we have a brand new program coming out called Starting Point. And Starting Point is your first six days as a believer. And it's a discipleship um, devotional program for six days. It's video driven by us and a journal to, to disciple you for the first six days of Christianity. And we're super, super excited about that. So let me bless you. Father, we thank you today that your word will never return to you void, but it will do exactly what you set it out to do. We bless everyone the sound of our voice, that their head and not the tail above and beneath. Everything they set their hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Happy Thanksgiving.